Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today, I have the pleasure of bringing my friend Johnny Cash Rodriguez for the first time. And today, JC is going to tell us all about the things he's been up to. And he's been up to a lot of things lately. Not only is his business booming, and he's even having a hard time with so many clients and he's having to bump his prices all the time because he's booming so much. But also he has another business coming on with another friend of ours, Jags. He's done some traveling, some skydiving. So we'll talk about this and much more. Thank you for coming, my friend. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gabe. I am excited to be on again. I love talking to you. It's been incredible getting to know you over the last year, and I'm super excited to where we're gonna see where we're gonna be in the next year too. So, yeah, thank you. The pleasure is mine. And as we were saying before we started, it's been a crazy year for for us and for all of our friends. And it's super awesome to see everyone growing, everyone starting a business or growing as a person, and the things that happen so fast when you are with a like-minded group of people. But really, I really wanted to start with a bang here. So man, tell us about skydiving. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of always wanted to go skydiving, but I'm kind of crazy. So like, uh, <laughs> and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, so like this, this winter, I talked to my wife, I was like, we really need to go skydiving in the spring. Like, I want to go, you should go with me. And so I had talked to uh, Morgan some, and she was like, there's this really great place down here to go. The guys are awesome. So I saw when, like, the first day that they were open, when I could get some tickets, uh, I, I found it and I scheduled it. And my wife wasn't completely on board at that point, but I bought her tickets anyway. <laughs> And, um, yeah. So, and then I was like, right, you know, in a month we're going to go skydiving and she was like, okay, I'll go with you. So yeah, it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in my life. I think like I'm someone who I got over my fear of heights when I was 19. I, you know, I've done a lot of um, very dangerous things. And I don't necessarily consider skydiving to be very dangerous, but, um, yeah. So the other thing that I like to mention is too, I had never been on a plane before I had gone skydiving. So on the ride up, it was really awesome to actually even be on a plane. Cause I never, never been on one before. And now I can say that I've been on a plane, but I've never landed in one. So, <laughs> um, it was just so the actual experience of falling, it was like one of the greatest, like letting go feelings you'll ever have. And then a lot of people ask me if it's like, like being on a roller coaster, you know, like when you're going down a great big steep part of the roller coaster is completely different. Um, it is nothing like that. It's just like you feel like you don't have a care in the world. And I don't know how to explain it. Other than that, and you get to like look out as far as you can see for hundreds of miles as you're falling. And, you know, there's this thing that I, I talk about a lot. It's that oftentimes our minds make a big deal out of things that aren't. And one of the ways that is helpful for actually doing the things that you want to do is proving to your mind that it isn't thinking anything that makes sense. And one of those ways is by doing those things that you don't think you can do, or you don't think are possible for you. Um, and, you know, skydiving wasn't a huge, like necessarily fear for me. So I wasn't afraid of like jumping out of the plane because I have done a lot of incredibly dangerous things before. Um, but it was great for me to do something that I'd never done before that allowed me to say, okay, I've jumped out of a plane now. So what else is there that I can't do? And, and on like a day-to-day -day basis, when you're able to prove to your mind that those things that are like, that you may be afraid of for no reason, it's a lot easier when you have something bigger to think back to that, 
oh, you know, this isn't a big deal because I did this. Um, so like that is my huge lesson that I've always gotten out of doing things like skydiving is that on a day to day, a lot of times we have this mis misproportioned fear inside of our mind because it's easy to be afraid of something. It's a natural instinct that we have, but to be able to rationalize that fear away and then actually take those actions that you want to take because you're no longer afraid, that takes proving to your mind that it doesn't know what it's thinking. <laughs> so yeah, that was um, just an incredible experience and I can't wait to go again. Yeah, man, I think you have the most awesome story ever by being able to tell people that the first time you got on a plane, you jumped out of it. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> like so unique that pretty much no one has that story and of course you're going to fly soon enough but you will still have the story of the first flight being the one you jumped out of so i wish i had never flown a plane ever <laughs> so i could say that too and i think you're right man like by doing these things that really put us on the edge and doing things that our mind thinks is they are impossible or things that we are supposed to be afraid of it really helps to put us above the hump in our day-to-day -day lives because sometimes it's something that's not really a big deal but we end up overthinking in our minds like oh i need to send a dm to someone and the person gets super anxious about sending a dm and if you rationalize it it's kind of ridiculous but it happens hey. and that also happens because we're not used to in our day-to-day -day, like the fight and fight or flight response used to be something that we really needed it. But in short little bursts, if we found an animal in the middle of the woods or something, but nowadays we pretty much don't ever need this, but our mind still thinks that the little things in our life, we would need to have that response. So it's good to do these things. And especially with your experience doing a lot of dangerous things, I think you already have sort of desensitize yourself from fear yeah you definitely could say that <laughs> so how do you think the experience was different between you and your wife because of course you are this badass that climbs super tall poles for years on end but she lives a more normal life so how was it for her yeah so she enjoyed the free fall she I, like I think the parachuting is a big letdown because it's not nearly as enjoyable as the free falling. <laughs> um, so she enjoyed it. Uh, she said that she's probably not going to go again, um, but she's glad that she did go um, because it was like, like no one would ever expect my wife to jump out of a plane. So she's that kind of person. Um, and she really appreciated, you know, that same fact of, oh yeah, this is something incredible that I've gotten to do. Her instructor, <laughs> her instructor, I think knew that she was a little nervous. So he did like a front flip off of the plane and yeah, watching her video is a completely different story from the one that I did. And, um, he even did a few like, like 180 spins with the parachute itself, which I didn't, I didn't get to do, but yeah, she, she enjoyed it. Um, and she was kind of like the same, same idea of like, she'll sometimes mention to me like, oh, this, this isn't a big deal. Like I jumped out of a plane. So, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I think she, she did enjoy it probably not as much as me, but yeah, it was still a great experience for her as well. Yeah. And I think when your kids are a little older, they'll think like my parents are crazy <laughs> what the fuck are they doing <laughs> and man what about the other things you've been up to with your guitars for instance with the music yeah so i took quite a break from playing anything even even like at my church or and whatnot and um except for the last month i've really been making it an intentional part of my day because I think a lot of times when we get busy with work, like those are the things we let go of first. And in reality, it's more like we need to figure out what's wrong with our work so we don't let go of the things that inspire us. So I've really been focused on 
just learning a few new songs consistently uh, johnny cash songs <laughs> and uh, i played yesterday at church which was a great uh experience to go back and play some bass again yeah i think that's the biggest thing i've been working on music wise and i think it's incredibly important to have those creative times away um because they just allow you to be in more of a flow state when you're in those times and out of those times I, that's definitely the biggest thing i've been working on with music lately yeah, I saw that you posted about this on LinkedIn, about how we need to carve out those times for things that inspire us. And well, while we're at it, what about your LinkedIn presence? I know it's the most important social media for you. How have the results been? And what about Lettercraft? I know you've got a bunch of new clients coming up. How's that been for you? Yeah, it's been really great. Um... I have been a little bit less consistent with my posting the last few weeks. I'm getting back on it. But yeah, it's been uh, really incredible. I think LinkedIn is a really unique social media platform. And the opportunity is huge there for people who aren't standard and want to like share who they really are because there's a lot of, I think, corporate... like staleness and things that are really standard on LinkedIn and they don't always do very well. So when you can bring that, those other things in your life, and I heard um, Gary V talk about this a few months ago when I was listening to one of his podcasts was that like, when you have a social media brand and you don't always want to like go completely off the side with all of your content but when you post those things that are more about your personal life and what you're doing it allows people to identify at a deeper level with you and it's not just oh you know jc's the email newsletter guy you know he you know plays guitar or he likes to talk about his family and his kids or you know why he does certain things in addition to the things that when people land on my page, they know clearly what I do. That other level of who you are is super important. And you can do that on other social media platforms, absolutely. Um, but I think if you want to hugely stand out with who you are, LinkedIn is a great place to do that. And I think this is a very contrarian to the popular thinking about LinkedIn because we tend to think that LinkedIn is full of drones of people that only say those very LinkedIn-y things mm -hmm. about their nine to fives. And, and this is a very contrarian look and it, it makes a lot of sense because you get to stand out a lot. And I was checking out some of the things that you've posted and in one of them, you were talking about having an MVA, so a minimum viable audience. So what's that concept about and how would you use it with a client? Yeah. So the minimum viable audience is something that I learned from Seth Godin um, in his book, This Is Marketing. If you've never read it, incredible book. And it just really helps to understand why it has worked the way it is. And that's because people can find who you are and what you do and they can be interested in it from anywhere around the world so we no longer need to think in terms of where is the best place for my store to be is it on the corner of this street or the corner of that street we have to think in terms for me to be happy how many people do i need to be able to influence and help them succeed in life in whatever way that I'm offering to help them. So that is in varying degrees. Like it depends on what your offer is, what you're proposing to help with, how much people are willing to pay for it. And that's your minimal viable audience. So to put it in perspective, you don't need a massive audience to make money. I had less than 
600 followers, six or 700 followers on LinkedIn when I hadn't my first client reach out to me and want to work with me, you know? So like the idea of needing massive amounts of followers to be able to monetize isn't true. But what is true is that you have to have that clarity for people to identify their needs with your solution and that clarity for people to understand who you are and what what you do and why you're a person that they should follow or be interested um, very quickly. Like, And I think that's what the biggest part that people struggle with, especially when they're starting. I struggled with it in the beginning, 100%. Like, you, you know, you saw my profiles, you know, in the beginnings. And um, when you do find those things that make you different and that clarity that you really need, that's when you're going to be hugely successful with a very small audience because you'll know who to connect with. You'll know who to, you know, who is your people and your people will know when they find you that there's someone that you're someone that they want to interact with. And I think that's the huge power of thinking in an MBA is it makes your efforts maximized with a lower expectation of what you actually need to succeed. Yeah, I think this is very common that we think that we need 1 million followers to get any kind of money. And I think that also stems because people usually think that the only way that you can get money is with ads or with like on YouTube, for instance, or mm -hmm. on other platforms like DX revenue share. And really, that's only a small fraction. And the guys that really make money on these platforms, the ad revenue is pretty much inconsequential by that point because of how many other things they can monetize. Yep. And you talked about having difficulty with clarity. Do you have any tips for people starting out so that they can get to that clarity point faster? Yeah, absolutely. So there are a few ways that you can go about it. The first I highly recommend is getting somebody else's viewpoint and opinions on what they actually see when they hit your profile, they see some of your content, um, whatever it is, whether it's your website, um, anything, getting that outside set of eyes to say, no, this is actually what I'm thinking. And you don't want it to be someone that's just going to tell you all great things, right? Because people that you really want to talk to probably aren't going to tell you what they're thinking. They're just going to click off, right? So that second set of eyes of, no, when, when I, read I read this, it makes me think this. When I read this, I want to do this. When I, you know, I see your banner, I don't understand clearly what you're trying to convey. Um, that is massive. Like if you want to just take your brand and, make it a rocket ship, get a few people that are really good at going over these things and that clarity. And you'll start to see the conversions go up on your profile, on your content. And then second, after that, I think when you're, you're trying to be clear with your statements, make it as short as possible. Like, can you, Tell me what you do in one sentence. And then can you tell me how that other person feels when you help them in one sentence? Like bringing what you do into a very easy and palpable set of words will create that ease for the person discovering you because we're inundated with our own content and what mm -hmm. we do all the time. And you know it like the back of your hand. So a lot of times it's really hard for us to understand when we're writing something or creating something, why someone who has never seen your content, they've never seen you a day in your life, why they can't understand what you're conveying and make it so easy for them to understand within a few seconds of reading because like it's not even necessarily about, you know, I hear people talk a lot about our um, attention span shortening, but people still watch hour long videos. They still read long form posts. They still do other, these things that 
take a lot more attention, it's because a lot of times we don't, especially early on, understand how to capture attention and keep it. So the easier you can make it for that person to slide into whatever information that you're giving them with that clarity is really going to help you be successful because, you know, it isn't going to take somebody 10 minutes to understand what you do. It's going to take them three seconds. And that's what people really need to make that first decision on whether they want to pursue more information from you or not. And when you're helping someone out with their email marketing, with their newsletter, of course, you also need to have that clarity. So in their landing page or in their profile, they must show, like you said, in one sentence, what they do and how they can help someone else. And how do you make it so that in the emails, you also show that clarity? It's what's, what are the most important points? The, the subject of the email, the, the headline in the beginning, what are the most important points for a successful email? Yeah, I think in the beginning, consistency is really huge. Just making sure that people are receiving something on a regular cadence from you because that is going to increase your open rates just from the fact that people know what to expect and they're starting to learn to what to expect from you. And then on top of that, I almost always use the rule of one with my newsletters in that. And newsletters are kind of hard to talk about occasionally because depending on what newsletter you have, if it's more of a informational like newspaper newsletter, um, you're not going to use the rule of one because your goals are different. So what I'm talking about is more towards those brands that have a high ticket offer or they may have a course, you know, they may have some sort of coaching deal or, you know, it's something education wise, right? Um, when you're writing those types of emails, you want the email to be about one thing. And you don't want to include anything that detracts or will take the person's attention away from that thing you're trying to convey because the more op opposing subjects that you add or even like links or things to go out, the less likely they are to actually take the thing, the step that you want them to take. And I think that's kind of a copywriting context that I always think of whenever I'm doing, like, it doesn't matter whether it's emails or my content. It's like, where are we going with this idea, this thing? And what is the next thing that makes sense for this person to do with this information? And it kind of encompasses your landing page. It encompasses your welcome flow, all the emails that you're writing. I think that's the biggest thing that people get stuck on in the beginning because they want to provide so much valuable information in every email that they often overload them or write emails that are way too long. Um, if you're writing new emails and they're greater than 600 to 800 words, that's probably a little excessive. I think we have a great opportunity when we're concise and can convey like very valuable, actionable things quickly to make those big impacts on the majority of people. Like if you think of your consumption, how often do you consume something that takes you 20 minutes or an hour? You know, probably not very often. So when you're expecting those people that you're writing to, to do that all the time, even though it is like, okay, I'm writing an email, so they're less distracted, but it's also you're making a bigger ask on their time, which is just as important as other things. So yeah, those are like my biggest recommendations for people writing emails is one idea and brevity over long explanations. Yeah, I think you have a great point in terms of brevity and in terms of shorter form content. And one of the reasons that it's done so well lately, because of course, if you're watching one minute videos, you can watch 20 of them in a row and it's still 20 minutes or less even, mm -hmm. but if you're watching an hour long or even more of, of a video, you just can't watch a bunch of them. It's impossible, physically impossible. You don't have as many hours in a day, even if 
you're sleeping and listening to something, you'll still have only 24 hours in the day. And it, it's very interesting to think about this and how we want to not only capture the attention of our prospective customer, but also be valuable enough and that they know that their time will be well spent. Is it a, 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 an email that they can read in one minute or in five minutes, but they know that they can expect that it will be worth it. Otherwise, maybe if you write too much and you kind of water down the message, they might think, well, I'm not sure if it's worth it opening these emails. Anymore. Yeah, absolutely. I think that expectation or that like understanding of what they really want is kind of an empathy thing that we as creators, like, I don't know whether it's like toning down our excitement or, you know, toning up our care, you know, one way or the other, like we are there because we're excited about the things we're creating, but we're there more to serve those people that um, are coming to us for this information, this like uh, help, helpful things that we're going to do and help them experience. So having that understanding of what they really want and what is going to be super helpful for them is another big big hurdle that i see and it, it's that's probably the hardest part if you really want to get down to the nuts and bolts of connecting with your audience is understanding at a very deep level who they are what they're interested in what they want from you and how you can serve them the best and do you have any tips on how to do that like maybe people tell us to have a persona and think about them as if they were a true person like it's a 25 year old guy who does this this and that do you do that kind of exercise or do you have any other tips on how to know better your audience do you use data what do you usually do yeah great question question so a there are some really great ways to go about that the best is probably direct feedback, whether you go and talk to your audience and say, Hey, what do you think of my content? What do you don't, what do you not like about it? What do you think that I can do better? You know, offer a free one-on-one -on -one call with someone and you're probably not going to get a great response if you just put it out there, like a free one, one-on-one -on -one call. But if you like actually are DMing people to get that kind of information um, and asking those quick target points of, you know, what would make this even more helpful for you? Um, that is a great way of finding out who they are, who you're really talking to. And I usually, so I sh generally shy away from demographics, depending on the subject. You know, they, are, they are important um, because the way that you talk to, you know, a 50 year old guy that has a nine to five is much different than how you talk to a 21 year old that's you know, still living at his mom's and going to the gym every day. Right. You know, so that part is important, but the, the more important thing is understanding their mindset and like what problem you're solving for them and what they believe about themselves and why they either like, what is that thing that is keeping them from their dream state? And that is really helpful. And, and you can, you know, put these into those personas and draw from that on a consistent basis, which is a, a great oh. idea. Um, but you also want to back that up with that evidence of who actually is consuming the content, because it might be something completely unexpected from what you've done your research on. Um, you know, great places to do research is like Reddit. Uh, there's a lot of great, I'm there often when I'm in my research phase to figure out what new ideas and what people are asking about in that niche. And that could give you, you know, another great resource to add to your content, like question wise, or asking those people that are following you, Hey, is this something you're dealing with? Um, is this something you'd like me to discuss in a future boast? Uh, 
you decide out of these topics what are you interested in hearing about like those are great ways to increase engagement and create that understanding of the audience that you have yeah man that's interesting i was taking some notes here and i think i need to go to reddit more reddit check out the, the new stuff. underbelly of the internet but it there's a lot of gold there if you dig for a while yeah i know man it's the deep web pretty much mm -hmm. But yeah, so I wanted to ask you also, since you are one of the successful cases of people who decided to start an online business, and if you think about it, you started getting some really good results in not so much time, because you really started, when was it, November, December, more or less? Yep. And now you're almost to the point that you can really ditch your 95 and really go full on full speed onto your own business. So what kind of tips would you give to people that are afraid that we might get into a recession soon and they're maybe a bit afraid, maybe I'll lose my job or something, or they already have a business, but they're still a bit afraid. What kind of tips would you give them? Yeah, I think when, you know, that's a, it's a really interesting perspective to have because there's always uncertainty, no matter what we're doing, whether we have a nine to five, whether we have our own business, whether we have nothing, <laughs> you know, there's always something that could happen. And I don't like to live in what ifs in the sense when you're choosing to do something it should be because it's something you love to do and it's not a fear-based response. So I always knew that I wanted to start a business. I just never knew how or what. Um, and I love helping others. So those are my huge motivations behind my business. And it is less like, you know, how can I use this to protect myself and more of like, how can I use this to help others? Because I think when we're coming from those places of scarcity of like in abundance, when in reality, like there are people that make money during recessions, there are people that are still successful in harder times. It's just because they believe that things are easy for them and they have the understanding of, you know, life comes and goes, but we always opportunities for us to build whatever we need to to achieve the things in our life and, and i think one of the things that i struggle with um or had struggled with was not having a, a long enough term vision because i always like thought that having a long-term vision was living in that what if mindset and what i realized was having a longer term vision allows you to those daily choices that are going to lead you to that vision rather than having, you know, I had an understanding of what I wanted to do with my businesses, but I never created that larger, okay, this is the true impact that I want to make with my business. And when I did that, it was much easier for me to not only take those actions that I need to but also see those opportunities that I might not have seen before because I didn't understand the gravity of what I could be doing in a year or two years or five years. So when like you map those things out and say, all right, am I building a business so that I can be safe in a recession or am I building a business that I can help, you know, a hundred thousand people, you know, solve this issue and that issue probably doesn't matter whether there's a recession or not right you know so when you think of it that way and then we also go back to the idea of your minimal viable audience that we talked about earlier you know those things become a lot less scary in the sense of we don't have to worry about our future and how things are going to end up because we're always taking those motivated actions to make that vision happen. And 
I believe that when those things are aligned, that those opportunities are going to, you know, flow to us because it's not like a hugely woo woo thing. <laughs> it's, it is in a sense of you have to be mentally open to the possibilities of what can happen, but you also have to be taking those steps to make those things happen as well. Um, I find, you know, we're here talking, I'm in America, you're in Brazil and we live a very incredible life. And as someone who has experienced very little and lots, you know, I've, especially lately, um, I've come to the realization that, uh, I also listened to this in, in another podcast that was incredibly helpful was that, you know, I've the saying of, I've always had enough, I always have enough, and I always will have enough. Um, and I just thought that that saying was so incredible because it puts so much perspective on the good life that we have, no matter what situation that we're in. And I'm an, probably an extreme optimist anyway. <laughs> and, you know, so I've always really excited about life and our potentials but that thought of okay you know so like what is the worst thing that can happen and realizing that i've always been taken care of makes those actions that i want to take a lot easier and less scary like building a business or you know any any of the the crazy things that i do because it just is that low laying belief that you're always going to be okay. So yeah, that was really long drawn out explanation. But... <laughs> oh, it wasn't drawn out at all, man. I think it was a beautiful answer. And to someone who's not afraid of jumping from a plane, like what could a recession be to you? you know? But I think you bring a lot of interesting points. Um, first, when you began talking about you always kind of knew that you wanted to have your own business because you wanted to help people. And in a way, I think that business is all about that anyways. Like you want to help people with a service, with a product, even if it's a B2B kind of business, at the end of the day, someone benefits from way down the line, but they will benefit from like whatever, like this bottle of water, for instance, like, they took out the the oil from from the ground and then they made the plastics and then somehow it went to some place where they filled it up with water. So, and now down the line, I, I actually refilled this, but anyways, you get the point. Mm -hmm. I'm using this like five steps down the line and it's being useful to me. And I think this is a beautiful thing about business and about how we can help people and sometimes indirectly even. But yeah, I think there are so many points that were interesting in your answer. I think that we we probably watched many of the same podcasts because I'm pretty sure that I, I heard that thing that you said as well. And actually I was in many points of my life, I was not as optimistic as I am today, but nowadays I'm just like you. I'm, I'm very optimistic and I used to be very anti woo woo stuff as well. But nowadays I don't think it's woo woo at all. I think there are books that you can read like psycho cybernetics or even think and grow rich, though it does go a little bit more into the woo side at, at times. And it's all about, you need to have this vision of what you want to do. Like you said that you, once you had a more clear vision of where you wanted to go with your business, things started clicking easier because if you don't, you're kind of giving your mind mixed signals. Like how can your mind is a perfect machine that wants to get you wherever you want to go, but you have to really tell it really well where you want to go and if you don't know it will be confused and you won't get anywhere or if you give it mixed signals and this happens a lot like people say they want something but deep down they are afraid of it 
because they have some limiting belief or mm -hmm. they have something that's creating a resistance and then your mind will kind of be confused. Do you want it? Do you not want it? And then eventually you don't really get it until you figure those things out. So I think it was a very interesting answer that you gave me. Uh, you know, I think we're all on a really incredible journey. And as long as we're committed to growing and trying to understand who we are and what we're supposed to be doing, like you're on the right path. And I think that's one of the most important realizations is wherever you are on that journey is where you're supposed to be. Oh so, yeah. Uh, it's just like incredible to me, it, especially like watching other people succeed and do great and fail and watching myself fail and learn from what I'm, what I'm doing and others, I think is just has been over the last year just the most incredible experience of my life. Yeah, I think when you get to meet people that are also trying to do these things, because let's face it, most people don't really try. And you see, it's not as hard as we tend to think in our minds, like to get moderately successful. I mean, it's more a matter of believing that you can and that you, if you do the right things, you kind of deserve it because it's, it's not like, oh, I deserve it because I'm entitled or anything. It's because like, we're willing to put in the work, we're willing to learn, we're willing to do a good service and improve along the way. So it's kind of a given if you have a long-term vision and if you continually try and try and you learn from your mistakes and reiterate, eventually you will get there, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think so too. And what about your other projects, houses? How is Zapping doing? Zapping's doing great. Um, yeah, so I haven't really talked about Zapping at all. Like we haven't released any information about it. Um, we're very close to bringing our MVP out. Um, I imagine it will be done in the next couple of weeks. And we're super pumped about it because we felt this issue that it solves uh, very deeply and we are excited to be able to help others save time with really one of the greatest drivers for growth on LinkedIn. Zappin is a AI assistant tool that will help with your LinkedIn engagement. It's going to help you identify those people that you want to engage with. It's also going to, and this is probably the feature that a lot of people are really excited about, keep that li those lists of people that you are engaging with and you want to engage with directly on LinkedIn. So you don't have to go outside to some Excel spreadsheet to, you know, however you keep those, maybe keep them written down and, you know, a book you keep in your pocket, but <laughs> um, no, it's going to really save you or save the people that are spending that time on LinkedIn. Um, hours in the day of organization of cognitive load um, because it's going to help you understand and respond to posts um, and time finding those people who are interested in your service and on linkedin it's less of i'm just going to post all the time and more of okay who um, needs my service and where are they? And then it's going to help you find those people to engage with. And if your profile has that clarity, um, they're going to understand who you are and be much more likely to engage with you. And do you guys also offer um, some help with clarifying your profile yeah so there's going to be um some webinars that we go over that with uh there is going to be some information zappin's newsletter coming up about it as well so we'll have blog posts on it and so that people have that information to utilize the tool properly because we want people to see those conversions we want them to see inbound leads and you know the excitement that we've experienced on LinkedIn and the success that we've seen um, with the same methods that Zappin is going to make very easy. And do you see some of these strategies like webinars and 
blog posts and some of these other strategies, do you think that you might implement them on Lettercraft as services that you can offer as well sometime? Or do you have anything else that you're cooking? You say implement them as services. What do you mean? Like, for instance, you talked about webinars. So maybe you can also offer this as like, I can help you set up a, web, a monthly webinar for an extra um, however much. I'm not sure. I mean, like I've talked about that as strategies for people that they can do. And it's easy to, you know, bake into an email <laughs> newsletter, welcome sequence or whatever, you know, so yeah, I, I don't know if it'll ever be an addition to my main offering, but if someone is interested, then I definitely think we could work something out. So, <laughs> but yeah, um, we want to make Zappin like our huge focus is making it as easy to use and with the information. the information that you need to be the most successful. We don't want it to just be like, oh, that's another cool AI tool that I have on the shelf and then you put it over there and you never use it. <laughs> like, um, our huge goal is creating um, a huge amount of time savings and a huge impact for the people that, that are using it, that are using LinkedIn actively. Obviously, it's very platform specific. Uh, for now, but um, I think that as long as we can provide a great experience, help people with the things that they need on that platform, then we'll be really successful if we ever get the feedback that we need to move somewhere else as well. Yeah, I think that with these kinds of services, sometimes it pays off to use your MVA and really niche down because you can help less people, but you can help them a lot instead of being a cookie cutter, run of the mill kind of thing that you kind of help a bunch of people and a bunch of things, but you don't really help anyone. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be a better strategy that you guys are doing. We're, we're super pumped about it. Um, everything is very much ready to go. We've been posting like on our company uh, social media pages, but we haven't really moved much on our founder brands just because have everything lined up exactly yet, but when that day happens, we're definitely going to be utilizing those uh, other brands to bring more awareness about Zappin, and that's a large part of our strategy in the beginning. So, so um, I, you know, a lot of successful SaaS brands that I see and that we've done research on are founder-led, and I think if you have any business these days that they really need to be founder led and you're going to see the best um, return on investment for your time with social media if you have that business in addition to your founder's brand so yeah that, that's a that's a huge part of our strategy right now yeah and could you elaborate a bit more on the importance the personal brand for founders of companies yeah i think one of the best examples is Tyler Denk from Beehive. I recommend any founder to go follow him because he has created not just a newsletter company, but company where all of his employees are just as excited about Beehive as he is. And the level of personal outreach that he does is just incredible. I don't know how he ever has time to <laughs> respond to. Like, I was just scrolling through my feed the other day, and someone posted complaining that their Beehive page got locked out the day before. He was there commenting on it. Um, and, like, what that has allowed him to do is create a personal connection from away from his brand that humanizes his brand and a lot of bigger companies struggle with that human part you know if you see a company page a lot of it is generic it's hard to get any personality out of that but when you have that face of the brand on social media and you're excited and you're not afraid to speak your opinions and and what you think it allows those people that who are really interested in being a part of your tribe to not just identify with your brand, but identify with the person running it and trust that, you know, they're going to be taken care of because they know the CEO of the company or, you know, they know these prominent people in the company. And I think 
it's so important for seeing the growth of your company with brand champions, which is still a very underutilized strategy. You know, now there's, there's thousands of people that advocate for beehive and their referral program is out of this world. You know, the, well, the partner program, I should say not referral. I'm talking about like when you refer someone to use beehive, um, and utilizing that is free advertising, which I don't think a lot of founders understand uh. from a brand champion standpoint is when you're able to create that kind of social media traction, it opens up so many doors to more business because you have so many more people talking about you for free. <laughs> There's not any paid advertising involved. There's not any like negative effects of it other than you have to spend time being in the public eye and not being afraid to share those things and be that person that people can look up to. Yeah, I think the biggest example of this is Elon Musk. Oh yeah. Oh, Elon is my favorite. I start actually, um, <laughs> I was watching his post like three months ago, um, where he was playing Diablo four and talking about Starlink and uh, Mars and you know, all this incredible stuff. And I was like, if Elon Musk can play video games as like the richest man in the world, why am I not playing video games occasionally? <laughs> so if I was you like, want to. you know, like, um, it was something that I had stopped doing, but then I was like, Oh, if he has time for it, why don't I make a little bit of time for it and relax? But yeah, Elon Musk, I think is what an incredible example of vision and drive and like living life to achieve something incredible, you know? So yeah, I love Elon. He's one of my favorite. Uh, yeah. And he is a master marketer. <laughs> Tesla doesn't spend a single dollar in ads mm -hmm. because of him, because he's always doing something or he has an event or he said, he says something on Twitter that's a bit edgy and people are always talking about Elon and by default about his company. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah. A and that's Elon is a great example of the unattainable, well, maybe unattainable isn't the right word, the unimaginably impossible mission. And, you know, a lot of people thought he was crazy 20 years ago, and people are realizing that what he says, he's probably going to do. <laughs> and I, you know, obviously he's failed with lots of things, but the things that he has achieved have been very incredible that I don't think anybody could have predicted 20 years ago. Um, and a part of that is that massive vision that he has not only for himself, but for all of humanity that allows people to believe in something greater than themselves. And that's what people are looking for um, with everything in our world. We need something need a vision that we can believe in just as strongly as the person that believes it. Yeah. We need some crazy people, some crazy things and great things. And I think actually we kind of lack that vision. I think when we go back a hundred years ago, 150 years ago, it seems like there were more people like an Elon, like the Henry Ford's, the Carnegie's, the Rockefeller's of the world. And nowadays we kind of, only look up to Elon in this same sense, <laughs> like maybe base was a little bit, but really the only one that's really, or at least that has embraced that Tony Starkish crazy guy look is Elon. Mm -hmm. But I think we needed to have at least 10, 20 Elons to really push innovation. Oh yeah, absolutely. And what, what else are you excited about lately, man? Yeah. Um, I'm super pumped about everything AI. I could talk about that for days. I think that we're living in a very incredible period of humanity and understand that we're also at like me and you talking about this, we're the 1% of 1% that understands what 
AI's impact is going to be and where we're going to be able to take it in the next 10 years. So yeah, um, my usage of AI has only gone up and I just think it's so incredible for people to be able to stay up on new things that are happening, you know, what they're doing with Claude, um, Meta just released that massive new open source model, which is really incredible. And yeah, it's just exciting. <laughs> I think we're living in a really exceptional time. Man, have you been playing with those new LLMs or do you play with other types of AI as well? What are your new toys that you've been playing with? Yeah, I use the newer version of Claude quite a bit. It's very, it, it understands a lot that I really like. Um, I had used Meta's new model a little bit for just playing around with it some. I didn't get very deep into it. The thing I love about Llama is it is like insanely fast. It is like ridiculously fast. Have you ever tried the image generation on it? No, not it, really. It literally changes the image while you're typing. It is so fast that I just, I don't know how they do it compared to other models. But anyway, like I don't use a lot of AI gem generated images. Um, a lot of it's just like personal stuff that I'm doing on the platform. But yeah, for like, because <laughs> I have a lot of discussions with my friends and even in what relates to like programming and coding, they say like, even if Meta's AIs aren't quite as smart as say Claude, they, the responses are just so much faster that it's easier to just get them out of Meta and then adjust them a little bit and faster than work on one of these other LLMs that take, you know, they might take 10 seconds to respond, whereas Meta is like instantaneous. So yeah, that, that's been a really big one that I've used lately a lot. I use Perplexity all the time for doing research um, and helping me with writing. Um, I'm really excited as NVIDIA starts releasing more into the AI world. They've got some new really cool chips coming out and some of the, I think, applications of their AI agents over the next year is going to really revolutionize how we approach software and approach like customizableness of the softwares that we're using. Um, I think it's going to take a while for those things to actually like filter down to consumer levels, but it's understanding the direction of where these things are going is really exciting to the potentials that you can use them for in the very near future. You know, I, I think there's a lot of places where you can use AI now, whether that's in customer service, whether that's in um, organizationally using them for spreadsheets, using them for like taking large data sets and processing them very quickly. Um, companies need to be looking into saving hours and hours of labor on how AI is can come into their business now. And that's that's another huge business model are people that come in and set up AI systems for other business. I've been on a call with uh, multiple people that do that. And it's definitely only going to be a field that grows and grows. And how do these models work? The business model of helping companies set up AI, like wh what do they do usually? What kind of models do they use or what kind of, how is that business model? I never really got into it. Yeah, I think a lot of what they do is setting up the integrations with what you're using now and setting up basically the interactions between that agent and your current systems. So I was listening to a podcast on this specific example. Um, say you have like a ton of, voicemails you're some sort of call center and you need to process all of them and understand what those what information is in them and what you can do with it one of these methods would be coming in and setting up the ai so that 
pulls those voicemails out, processes the information, gives you that information in a spreadsheet or some sort of aggregated database where you can pull and say, okay, yeah, that these ones were complaints I really need to look into. These ones can be used as reviews. These ones are this type of issue. Um, like setting up those kinds of informations or even if it's maybe a business doesn't have a chatbot on their website that helps their customer out. They're going to come in, pull that information to train an AI on your system and all of your information so that it's giving those right responses to the people that are asking those questions about your company. Those are the the top level easy ones. Well, I shouldn't say it's easy because I have no conceptual idea of um, the difficulty of setting something up like this. I just know it's done very often now. You know, I'm very confident that there are a lot more applications that companies could pick up on. Like the features, like the vision features are another huge one of you taking a picture and saying how many things are here and how much are they worth? Like inventory wise, could you imagine just, you know, taking some pictures of all of your inventory and the AI, just counting it all up and making sure that everything's correct. Um, you know, th those are a few of the examples I can think of, of um, those businesses that would benefit from some sort of AI exploration where they're using it in whatever workflow that they need to. Yeah. And if you think of it, you can use it in pretty much anything. And like you said about the inventory and I was thinking of industry 4.0 and how it's pretty much about using AI and putting sensors on every machine and using AI to get that data and transform it into something useful. But I think since we usually talk about online businesses now, sometimes I kind of forget <laughs> that we have those physical things as well and that they are actually more important even. But you know, a thing that it's interesting to think about too is what won't change because it's very easy to think about the things that might change, the things that will change, but what about the things that will stay the same, the fundamentals? Because I think that's where we can really invest because it's something that it will never change or will be relatively similar. So what do you think are things that either won't change or they tend to appreciate in value with time? Yeah, I think, I don't know, that, that's kind of a hard question to go over because... I think there's a lot that's going to change societally in the next 10 years, but um, I think our human interaction is always going to be super valuable, whether that's in art or music or whatever we're doing. Like, I don't think those things are ever going to go away. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about though. Yeah, about anything really, for instance, food is an industry that one way or another will always be important or for instance we were talking about email marketing and people tend to keep their emails much longer than pretty much any form of so of online presence so these things that might change or like you said the music part like when everyone starts creating videos or music using ai music that's created by a human being or especially that's played live by a human being tends to appreciate and value because no one's actually wasting their time learning how to play an instrument nowadays but the few people that do know how to play an instrument will be more valued that kind of thing that i was yeah. thinking about yeah absolutely yeah i guess yeah i don't think AI is going to <laughs> replace us as humans. So I think there's a lot that is going to be made easier for us, but it's going to be able to allow us to take those times and those things that we really want to do that are really valuable and be able to spend more time doing the things that we love.
and less time doing the things that we don't want to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I think from a fundamentals point of view, there's always going to be needs and things for us to live our lives. It's just going to be more of a question of what do we truly value in our life and how do we make that our main focus as humanity or as a person. And I think that goes back to your LinkedIn post in which you talked about doing the things that we love or that make us creative, the things that we really put our hearts into. And you mentioned music, you mentioned hiking on that post and, you know, learning how to leverage the tools, but at the same time, not be enslaved by those same tools so that we don't just keep chronically online and not actually do the things we're supposed to do. We're just doing more stuff, but we're not actually doing what we should be doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think getting out in nature and having your hobbies is, you know, <laughs> Uh, I was listening to, I think it was David Shapiro who was talking about this a little bit, in that, like, a lot of people are concerned about AI, like, taking over everything and us not being, like, just, like, kind of more dystopian things. But he took another viewpoint of why the AI would want to keep us around. <laughs> and that is because, like, humans are like the most random things in the universe and it's very hard for us to understand you know it would be very hard for the ai to understand completely the reasoning behind why we do everything that we do you know um us as humans living that lifestyle we should absolutely take those times to be human i i find that this is kind of a weird thing that i have to say but <laughs> like <laughs> allowing yourself to take in the beauty of the universe that we're living in and do those things that make us authentically human just is the best thing that you can do for yourself and i think i guess from this perspective of there's a lot of culture online that you need to give up everything to have the things that you want i think that culture is very mistaken and giving up everything that you want isn't living the life that you want to live <laughs> and i don't think it's going to bring it around any sooner um so just be you <laughs> yeah man I, i think you bring an interesting point that we kind of were sold a scam by society so there are many people that they have everything in fury they have the well-paying job in new york and But at the same time, they have New York expenses. So they actually live in a super small apartment and pay a huge rent to be with like eight roommates. So at the end of the day, you don't actually have any money left over. You're just, in theory, you're living the life. You have the good paying job and everything, but at the same time, you don't have any money left over. These people, end up not starting their family anytime soon. So you kind of realize at some point that it's kind of a scam and that then you're so that that idyllic paradise of having time to do things or to go to the woods once in a while. That's no, that's impossible. That's something after you retire or something. But it's actually it's not supposed to be that hard. And I think that nowadays, especially when you can do so many things online and you can have an online business and pretty much work from anywhere, this shouldn't be that much of a problem if you just find the right skills and the right niches to target and to help people in. You can have, you don't even need to like make a hundred thousand dollars a month or something, the, those ridiculous claims that people make on the internet. But with a moderate or moderately high income, you can live a good life in most of the world. And my friend, I've asked you this a few times already, but you know, sometimes these things change. The, do you think your definition of success has changed? I'm pretty sure the last two times it has, and it has definitely changed again <laughs> um, that you've asked me this. Yeah, I think I am successful and 
I don't think that we should be so hard on ourselves for our definitions of success. I think that's my, my current change is I have even more plans than the last time that we talked and even more things that I'm looking forward to. But I also, what I'm doing now and I feel very successful. So I think. I think this is kind of what uh, my wife asked me the other day. She goes, how can you say that you're content when you have all these big plans? And I think there's a interesting tension in being very happy with where you are now and excited on going somewhere else. And I think that tension is what living a truly successful life is, is seeing and accepting your level of success while looking forward to the next level. This makes me remember a thing that's a similar tension. And if you think of it, it's pretty much the same thing that I saw in a video the other day. And it's about reconciling self-improvement with being enough at the same time. So feeling that you are enough, that you deserve to have things, to do things. But at the same time, you still strive to be better, to improve yourself, but not in a way that we usually tend, because many people end up turning self-improvement into this never-ending process, and you're always kind of self-flagellating. But mm -hmm. you can reconcile it and have that tension, like you mentioned that you told your wife, like, I know that I have these grander plans and I know that there are many things I still want to achieve, but at the same time, I am content with where I'm at. And because you know that you will eventually achieve those things, because you know that at this time, at this point in time, it's kind of a no brainer. It might take a little bit more than you think. It might take a little bit less, but you know that eventually you will get there. And if you just keep doing what you're doing, so. I understand definitely where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're way too hard on ourselves a lot of time and we just need to be happy. So <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a lesson that we have to learn the hard way. And after you learn it, then you learn how to reconcile. I think maybe there's no way that you can't, that you can be at this point of, of living the tension in a healthy way if you haven't kind of burnt out yourself like being too hard on yourself or or the opposite because many people are too soft as well so i think you yeah. have to go to one of the extremes and then come back so that you can you know walk that fine line and my friend are there any final considerations you like to leave our audience with any things that you like to plug anything that you'd like to talk about yeah um i think i will just leave it with I'm so excited that we're here, that we're experiencing the life that we have. I'm so excited to see what's ahead. And if you are a forward thinker and would like to have a conversation or get to know me a little bit better, you can find me on LinkedIn or on X at LetterCrafter. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my friend, JC Rodriguez. Thank you so much for coming again, my friend. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Gabe. It was awesome. Appreciate it.